Now, of course, in Luke chapter 2, it is the famous passage about Jesus Christ's birth, um, often referred to or often read very, you know, in, in churches across America or churches across the world around Christmas time as it tells a great story of, of Jesus' birth with, with all these wonderful details in chapter 2. And, um, you know, today's Christmas Eve. And I thank God that, that we have a church service on Christmas Eve to, to recognize and to not lose sight of, of what the day is all about, what Christmas Day is all about, what we're really celebrating. Because we're not celebrating Santa Claus. We're not celebrating, you know, some tree. We're not celebrating these things. Um, we're celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And we celebrate by getting together with family, by exchanging gifts, eating a nice meal together. And these are all great things to do. Um, we do them. They're, it's very enjoyable. But with the hustle and the bustle and the, and the you know, trying to see people and, and getting everyone together, we, we can't lose sight of the day itself, of, of the recognition of Jesus Christ and why it's so important. And, um, you know, we're celebrating the day that the Word was made flesh, that God was manifest in the flesh. And we're going to get back to Luke chapter 2. We're kind of going to do a little bit of a Bible study through it. But if you want to flip over real quick to John chapter 1 to just understand the importance of Jesus Christ and His birth and what it means. John chapter 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made in him was life and the life was the light of men and the light shineth in darkness and the darkness comprehended it not and then jump down to verse number 14 it says and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth Jesus Christ is that word, the word, the same word that was with God in the beginning and that was God. Jesus Christ was made flesh and we're celebrating the day that he was made flesh. Now, obviously, look, I know that we don't know the exact day that Jesus Christ was born and a lot of people have problems with December 25th and they say it's pagan roots and everything else. Well, we got to pick a day to, to, well, we don't have to if you don't want to. Okay, we don't. There's nothing in the Bible that says you have to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. But there's nothing wrong with celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ either. And since we don't know the day that he was born, I see no reason in, in forsaking the tradition of celebrating the birth of Christ on December 25th. I don't think there's a problem with that at all. But um, as we are celebrating... The reason we're celebrating, of course, is because the Word was made flesh. Isaiah chapter 9. And this is, mind you, this is a great verse that I like to turn to because it's so well known. But when you're talking to people like the Mormons or the Jehovah's Witnesses that don't believe what we just saw in John chapter 1 about the Trinity, about the three in one, about Jesus Christ being God in the flesh. Isaiah chapter 9 is a great verse, and I'll tell you why. This is one of the reasons why I like going there is because in their New World Translation, specifically with the Jehovah's Witnesses and with the Mormons, they, they, they use the King James Bible, it'll say the same thing or almost identical the same thing. And Isaiah 9, 6 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And I always stop people right there and say, what is this verse talking about? Who is this prophesying of? And they always say, well, this is talking about Jesus. Of course, it's talking about Jesus. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. You see this on greetings cards at Christmas time. People have it on plaques, on decorations throughout, the, throughout their house. Unto us a son is born. Unto us a child is given. This is the prophecy of Jesus Christ coming. But let's keep reading. Verse number 6 says, And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. 
We have two names given to Jesus Christ in this chapter of the mighty God and the everlasting Father. Why in the world would you call Jesus Christ the everlasting Father if he was not God in the flesh? Why would you call him the mighty God if he was not God in the flesh? And you can show this to them and, and you don't, you're not going to get a good answer. I'll tell you that right now. They can't answer that question. Because then you have to ask them, well, how many gods are there? If Jesus Christ is called the mighty God, how many gods do you believe in? Because we believe in one God. We believe there's three manifestations, but those three are one. And the Jehovah's Witnesses, the more, well, the Mormons believe in all, a whole multitude of gods, but it's hard enough, it's like pulling teeth trying to get them even to admit what they believe. But the Jehovah's Witnesses, oh, no, no, we believe in one God. Then why is Jesus called the mighty God if he's not God? Why is Jesus called the Everlasting Father if He's not? If that, why, why would He be given that name? No, my friends, it, he, is, he is the Everlasting Father. He is the Prince of Peace. He is the Mighty God. He is wonderful. He is the Counselor. Verse number 7 of Isaiah 9 says, Of the increase of His government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon His kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. As, or Philippians chapter 2. And of course, 1 Timothy 3.16, while I'm on the um, reference of, of witnessing to, other, to people that are in cults, that are in these false religions, Jehovah's Witnesses and the, and the Mormons. Um, you know, 1 Timothy 3.16 is a great verse, and it's true. It says, Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in the glory. Excellent verse. Again, showing us that God was manifest in the flesh, but the New World Translation changes that. And instead of saying God was manifest in the flesh, it says He was manifest in the flesh. So you just have this ambiguity and they say, who's He? Oh, well, yeah, Jesus. Jesus was manifest in the flesh. Totally eliminating the power of the verse saying God was manifest in the flesh. So there's plenty of verses you can turn to, and I believe, you know, proving the deity of Jesus Christ. Try to have mul multiple verses in your memory or in your notes, in your Bible, or however you, however you do it, um, so that when you're we're trying to prove that to someone, you're not just relying on one verse. Because if, if 1 Timothy 3.16 is the only one that you know, I mean, hey, use it. It's the Word of God, right? The Word of God is powerful and, it, and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. And, um, you know, hopefully that could pierce through. But unfortunately, what, what a lot of these people will do is they say, well, that's not what my Bible says. And, and they'll just ignore what you just said. But... Um, so have a few references in mind. Philippians chapter 2, look at verse number 4. The Bible says, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And we're going to learn a little bit about Christ Jesus now in the next few verses. But I love this verse about the humility, the humbleness, the mind that needs to be in you, where he says, Don't look on your own things. Look on the things of others, because this is what Jesus did. And as we celebrate the birth of Jesus, we should also be celebrating His life and all the wonderful things that He's done for us and that He's done for mankind in the, in the, the, the years of, the exist, of His existence physically on this earth and then also, of course, His death and His resurrection. But Jesus Christ had this mind as a man on this earth that... He wasn't minded about his own things. He was minded about the things of others. Verse number 6 says, Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Yes, Jesus Christ, God, the, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the same Jesus that was made flesh. Think about the glory and the honor and the power and, and everything that Jesus had prior to be, becoming an infant. Just prior to Jesus Christ being manifest in the flesh, before the Word was actually made flesh, 
He had the power. This is the same Jesus that created the heavens and the earth. But he made himself of no reputation. He was born into a humble home. He took upon him the form of a servant. The King of kings and Lord of lords became a servant. And was made in the likeness of men. It says, in being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, which even the death of the cross was a shameful death. It wasn't just any death that he endured. He suffered a death of sh uh, 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 execution that was shameful. That was for the, for the worst criminals. Verse number 9 says, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. When the next time Jehovah's Witnesses want to ask you, well, what's the name of God? What's the name of God? Well, why don't you show them this verse? Well, there's a name that's above every name, and that's at the name of Jesus Christ. And if people are going to be bowing down to Jesus and worshiping Him, and it's going to bring glory unto God, how can that be when God said that thou shalt, you, thou shalt not have no other gods before me, and thou shalt not bow down nor worship you know, any man or any idols or any likeness of any man or beast or anything, yet God's going to be pleased when we bow down and worship Jesus Christ. It's because He is God in the flesh, because He is God. Let's go back to Luke chapter 2. And we're going to get into the story a little bit of Jesus. So many times... <clears throat> We live a Christian life. We go to church. We try to do what's right. You know the story of Jesus. You tell it over and over again. At least I do. I know when I go out soul winning, I try to, try to tell people about Jesus and tell them what He did for us and tell them how He did these miracles. And sometimes you know the story so well and you could say it so many times that it might cease to be real to you. And not that I mean you don't believe it or anything. Of course you still believe it. What I mean, though, is that it needs to be re you need to understand how real it is and get your mind to the place to understand what he really did and what he really went through. And when we read these stories, what I say by me make it real is get yourself into the story. When you read, when you read these Bible, when you read the Bible in general, when you read these stories, try to read it in such a way where it's not just words on a paper, but where you are inserting yourself into the story and you're seeing these events going on around you, and it's and it's real. That's why I'm bringing up the the power and the might of the Almighty God becoming a man and humbling Himself, because that's what really happened. And when we think about these things. Of, of how vast the universe is and how mighty and powerful you know, um, God is to be able to speak these things into existence. And we see little snapshots of the power of God and oftentimes within nature you, and you know, experience these great earthquakes and tornadoes and tsunamis and, and these other massive forces of nature that men can, are essentially powerless against you get a very small dose, a very small dose of the power of God Almighty and what He's capable of. And that same God, with all that power, restricting Himself to becoming a man, lowering Himself to be put into a fleshly body. And all of it was done for us. The amazing love that God has for us is incredible. Let's look at Luke chapter 2. We're going to start here in verse number 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, 
which is Christ. Well, let's look at start in verse number 10. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. This is the angel talking to the shepherds keeping their flocks by night. And the angel saying unto the shepherds, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. Jesus Christ is our Savior. He saves the world from their sins. He says, Which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. So he tells them, Today, Jesus Christ, the Christ was just born. Jesus was just born. The Savior. The Savior of the world was born. And here's how you're going to know who He is. He was born today, and you're going to find Him in a manger. He's going to be swaddled. He's going to be wrapped up. And you'll see him laying in a manger. It says, And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Oh, what it would be like to be one of those shepherds to just witness this one event. This one event of the angels. This one event of being surrounded, being in the company of an entire host of angels. And they start singing and praising God. It says the angel, a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. At this monumentous event of a Savior being born into the world. Verse number 15. And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. So the angels had just told them the sign that they were going to see a babe lying in a manger and that the Christ was born and the Savior was born into the world. And they witnessed all of these things and after they had seen it, they made known abroad this saying and they started spreading the news and telling people everything that they had seen and what they had witnessed. Verse number 18 says, And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. So, what an amazing thing. Imagine being in Mary's place while all of these things happened. She had already, nine months earlier, been approached by an angel and, and was informed that she had been chosen to carry Jesus in her womb, that, that she was going to be you know, his mother, and, and what an honor that is for her, and that he was going to be called Jesus. And you know, she witnessed this. She, she obviously had conceived, was conceived of the Holy Ghost. She had not known a man, yet she became pregnant, carried the baby, and was delivered of him. And they have no idea that, that the angels had, had presented themselves before the shepherds. And there, I'm sure, you know, she's recovering from just giving birth. Jesus is lying in the manger. They're resting. And then these shepherds show up. And they tell them, you know, this great story of the angels. And they were singing praises unto God. And they tell them everything that happened. And Mary's just, just receiving all this stuff and just keeping it and just kind of pondering and wondering at these things. Because it is a wonder for all these things that have happened. I can't imagine what that must be like to have, to have gone through this in reality. What, it, what an amazing, exciting event these are and, and to kind of go through it. See, now we have the whole story. It's easy for us to look back at this and, you know, we know it frontwards and backwards, but actually going through it and just every day is a new day and not knowing what's going to happen, not knowing, you know, even just the night that she was giving birth, there was no room for them. There was, people were being taxed. They were going out and there were a lot of people in town and, you know, the hotels were all full. They didn't have a place to stay, but she had to give birth. And so she was able to give birth at this place. And, um, you know, thankfully I had some kind of shelter. But what an exciting time to be through and, know, and knowing that, that you're carrying 
the Christ. You're carrying Jesus in your womb. It must be amazing. Well, let's keep reading here. It says, verse number 20, and the, and the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Now, I want to flip back real quick. Here we see um, another reference. Look at Matthew chapter 1. We're going to see where the angel appeared and told Mary what the name of the child was going to be, which she, which she did. She named the child Jesus as she was told was going to be his name. Matthew chapter 1 in verse number 20 says, But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Now, we see here, this is when, when Joseph gets the news that, that Mary is pregnant, that Mary is with child. And he's thinking, what's he going to do? And he's minded to put her away, the Bible says, to put her away privily, so as not to make her a public example. Joseph was thinking about getting a divorce from Mary because obviously he thought that, that she had been, she, you know, she was committing adultery, that she had cheated on him, or that, you know, before they were espoused, she was committing fornication. And um, so he was thinking, okay, well, I, I don't want to go through with this. And as he was just kind of thinking about these things, molding it over in his mind, you know, angel of God appears to him and tells him, um, you know, don't fear to take Mary to be your wife. She, she did not commit fornication. You know, it's not what you think. She, what, what's in her, it says, that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. The word of means it's from. It's from the Holy Ghost. And this is the reason why Jesus Christ is the Son of God in the Bible. He's also called the Son of Man. He's called both. He's referred to as the Son of God and the Son of Man because the reason why He's the Son of God is because when He was physically born into this, into this world, His Father was, the, you know, was God the Father, was the Holy Ghost that, that conceived in that womb and Jesus Christ was formed and made a man. And he's the son of man because he was born of Mary. He was born of a woman and, and physically born into this world. So he was the son of God and the son of man. And um, it's important to, to understand that distinction that, that, he was con that, that the conception was of the Holy Ghost. Verse number 21 says, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. This is the whole reason why his name was going to be called. His name was important. And I believe names are important. Names tell you something you know, about a place, about a person. Being called by a name, the angel said, Joseph, your son's, this, the child's name, your stepson's name, the child's name is going to be called Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. That's the meaning behind the name of Jesus. He is the Savior. He's going to save the people from their sins. Verse 22 says, Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. And that's a reference from Isaiah chapter 7. You have to turn there. Isaiah 7, 14 says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Butter and honey shall ye eat that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child shall know, how, shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken of both her kings. This is a prophecy given in the Old Testament, given many, many, many years prior to the actual birth of Christ, we see here the Bible telling us, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And in Matthew 1, 23, it says, Behold, a virgin shall be a child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us.
the fulfillment of prophecy is another just wonder and, and, and amazing thing. That's how we know that God, it's one of the ways we know God is real. It's one of the ways we know when his prophets are, are who his prophets are and that they're telling the proof, uh, telling the truth. Isaiah was obviously a prophet of God. It was prophesied that Jesus Christ was going to come and a virgin was going to conceive, which is exactly what happened with Mary. There's so many prophecies from the Old Testament which come true. They, they, well, they all come true. Every prophecy comes true. If it's coming from the Lord, it's not going to fail. God's prophecies come true, and it's amazing. Um, all of the prophecies that, that came true just with the, with the birth of Jesus Christ coming into this world, when the world, Word was made flesh. Let's go back to Luke, Luke chapter 2. Luke 2, verse 22 says, And when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord, Every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. So here we see Mary and Joseph were, you know, they were upright. They, they feared God. They were following the law and um, for following God's law at that time to, to bring um, Jesus to be circumcised. And also this is talking about the purification of Mary. And it says in verse 24 of Luke 2, it says, And to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now this is some this is this was given in the law of the Lord for the purification. After a woman gave birth to a child, she needed to be purified. And we're gonna look at Leviticus. Turn if you would to Leviticus chapter twelve. We're just gonna look at a few verses that explain this real briefly about the purification. Leviticus chapter 12, verse number 6 says, And when the days of her purifying are fulfilled, for a son or for a daughter, she shall bring a lamb of the first year for a burnt offering, and a young pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering, unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, unto the priest, who shall offer it before the Lord and make an atonement for her. And she shall be cleansed from the issue of her blood. This is the law for her that hath borne a male or a female. So this is, this is what the law said. When a woman gives birth, because the blood issues forth, she's unclean. And the way that they dealt with that in the law was that she was to bring a lamb of the first year for a burnt offering and either a young pigeon or a turtle dove as her sin offering. This is what was the standard for, for the purification after having a child. But look at verse number 8 of Leviticus 12. It says, And if she be not able to bring a lamb, then she shall bring two turtles or two young pigeons, the one for the burnt offering, the other for a sin offering, and the priest shall make an atonement for her, and she shall be clean. So we see here there's kind of an exception made saying, well, you know, if a woman has a child and they don't have a lamb, they can't afford a lamb, they can't give a lamb as a sacrifice because they don't have it, you know, because obviously wealthy, middle, you know, middle class, poor people, everyone has children. So if you're not able to bring a lamb, that is the preferred sacrifice, but if you can't do it, then you could bring two uh, turtle doves or two young pigeons. And what we can gather from Luke chapter 2 is that Mary and Joseph must not have been very wealthy. I mean, they were already being taxed, but they must not have been that wealthy because it says in verse 24 that, um, and to offer a sacrifice to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So they brought the two birds. They didn't have the lamb. And um, we, could we could probably did pretty safely deduce that um, Jesus grew up in a humble home. He grew up with, you know, not a lot of, of riches and money and, and the world's wealth and things like that, um, as evidenced here by the fact that the, they were offering up just two, two birds instead of a lamb and a bird as their sacrifice. But let's keep reading here, verse number 25. And this is important to understand that too. Jesus, you know, the money doesn't matter. And oftentimes not having money and being humble will, will keep you in the right mind frame and keep, you, um, keep your heart right 
And hopefully you wouldn't be covetous, but be content with the things that you have. But let's keep reading it. Verse number 25, it says in Luke 2, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him, and it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And what else is interesting in Luke chapter 2 is just a little bit more about the humanity of Jesus Christ, about him being, about how God can become. Even though he was God, he fully became a human being and he literally had to grow. When he started off as a child, he didn't just have the whole knowledge of the universe in his brain. He learned to walk. He learned to talk. He learned these things as a child and grew up. And he actually grew and increased in his wisdom, which is another evidence that he didn't just have all knowledge when he took on the form of a man. He limited himself. What an amazing God that's even capable of doing such a thing. A God that can't be bound to be bound into a, a person. A God that, that knows everything and can speak things into creation to not have all wisdom, to not have all knowledge. It says in verse number 40 of Luke 2, And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Um, verse 42, and, now, and when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. So he's 12 years old at this time. And we see him in the, in the temple and he's asking all these questions and he's learning. And it says um, <coughs> in verse 46, And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them, and asking them questions. So he's having these conversations with these doctors, doctors of the law, doctors who knew, who knew the, um, the law of God, and he was asking them questions and talking to them. And it says in verse 47, And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answer. So at 12 years old, now, was Jesus special? Of course he was. As God in the flesh, as, as having the Spirit of God on him and in him and... Um, you know, increasing this wisdom and this knowledge. Yes, he was increasing, but he was still a human being. It says um, in verse 50, and they understand not that uh, saying which he spake unto them, verse 51, and he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. So Jesus Christ was still, even though he was God in the flesh, he was still obedient. And at 12 years old, he was subject unto his mother, and his stepfather, he was, he was subject unto them. Those were his authorities. And the Bible says, Honor thy father and thy mother. And, and that's what Jesus Christ did. He, he was under subjection unto them as the child. Because he was without sin. And it says, But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. So again, we see as he's growing, she continues just she just sees all of these various things and she keeps them in her heart. But verse 52 says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So as Jesus is growing and learning and gaining wisdom, he's increasing. He doesn't have all wisdom. yet. He's, he's increasing and growing and learning more. And that shows us the humanity of Jesus Christ and the fact that God took on himself the form of a man. Now turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 2. We're going we're to close in Hebrews. Luke chapter 2 gives us that great story of Jesus Christ's birth, but Luke or Hebrews chapter 2. Yes. 
Hebrews chapter 2, look at verse number 8. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Jesus Christ was made even lower, like his own creation, the angels, he was made even lower. He was made a little bit lower than the angels for the suffering of death. That he should taste death for every man. That's why Jesus came to this earth, to taste death for every man, to be an atonement for our sins. Verse number 10 says, For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. And this verse always blows me away. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Our Savior, the Word made flesh, God manifests in the flesh, became a man. He that sanctifieth, which is Jesus, he's the one that makes us set apart. He's the one that makes us holy. He's the one that cleanses us from our sin. And they who are sanctified, those of us who are saved, as a result of his sanctification, it says, are all of one. And because we're all of one, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brethren. What an amazing love Jesus has for us. There's so many people today that are ashamed to name Jesus. What do you have to be ashamed about? Jesus was perfect. Jesus was... Jesus created the world and the heavens. And, and Jesus became a man and suffered all things. And was tempted in all points, like as we are, yet without sin. Jesus suffered humiliation, shame, spitting, mockings. People made fun of him. People left him. He had no, you know, some at one point he had no friends backing him up. Yet he still went through everything because he loved us. Even when nobody loved him, he still loved us. And even after he was forsaken, even after he was rejected, he still went through with everything and he's not ashamed to call them brethren, the Bible says. I think about all the sins that I've committed in my life and all of my imperfections and all of my lackings and shortcomings and, and things that I do that are wrong and times I've hurt other people and... and To read a verse like this that says that he's not ashamed to call them brethren. He's not ashamed to call me a brother. Go. You really ought to... It's humbling for me. And hopefully you can read a verse like this and it, and it can work in your heart when you can see the way that Jesus looks at us and the forgiveness that he has, to be able to bring yourself down a bunch of notches and, and understand the, the things that you worry about oftentimes and, and the problems that you have, in many cases, it's just absurd in the grand scheme of things compared to everything that Jesus went through. And then on top of all of that to say that he's not even ashamed to call us his brothers. Of all, after all the shameful things that we've done, to, for him just to stand with you and say, you know what, I'm not ashamed for them to be called my brethren.
yes, Jesus Christ truly will stay with you and he died for all of your sins. Now, we should, um, we should look at that with amazement and wonder and, and I mean, what, what's the... Have respect for, for what he did for us and, and decide to, to change our lives and to, and to not be ashamed, not to be a shame or bring a shame upon his name from others because he's not ashamed of us. Verse number 12 says, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lives subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. And then turn, if you would, to... Um, Hebrews 4, verse 15. Hebrews 4, verse 15 says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. God being made flesh, the Word becoming a man. We have a God that knows exactly what it's like to be a human being because He lived it. We know that His laws are not ridiculous. They're not impossible because He lived it and He did them and He followed them. He was able to do it as a man. He was the only one that's able to do it without sin. But when you go to God, when you think about God, remember that He knows our emotions. He knows our thoughts. He knows the things that are going on in our life. And when you truly do need sympathy, when you truly do need help, God knows better than anybody what you need. And it's comforting to know that. We have a high priest. We have a God that understands our infirmities. He knows what we're going through. When you feel alone, when you feel like nobody gets it, nobody understands, my husband doesn't understand, my wife doesn't understand, my kids don't understand, my family doesn't understand, my best friend doesn't understand what I'm going through, what all the hard times are, all these struggles and my pains and, and these problems that I have in my life, nobody gets it. God gets it. God understands very well. And just so that you, you wouldn't let yourself get too depressed or too caught up in your own struggles and worries, start comparing yourself and your struggles and your problems and everything else that you have with Jesus and what He went through. To help your perspective. With everything that Christ went through and everything that Christ had to face, even on this earth, knowing that he was going to give himself as a sacrifice, knowing that he was going to be crucified on the cross. He knew that he was going to be raised up from the earth before it actually happened. He knew that his soul was going to descend into hell because he prophesied of it himself, saying, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He knew it. He knew it. He had a lot of grief and a lot of things on his mind that could have, that, that, will cause you hardship and heartache and things that are difficult that he knew he had to face. 
Yet he still was our perfect example on how to live. He still remained humble. Knowing he was the God, God in flesh, and thought it not robbery to, be, to make himself equal with God, knowing this the entire time, still was a servant. Still humbled himself. Still washed the disciples' feet. put all of his cares aside and focused on other people, focused on the cares of others, focused on the well-being of others. And the ultimate sacrifice of giving his life and doing these things for us. What a day. You know, some people decide not to, to celebrate Christmas, but I love Christmas. I love I love taking a step back and just being able to meditate on the Word of God and to meditate on the things that Jesus did for us. And we have such an amazing God. We have, we have such a wonderful God. And the Bible talks, gives us all the information we need to know about Him. What I encourage everybody to do this year, if you have an appreciation, if you have a reverence, if you have a respect for God, if you're thankful for what He's done for you and you're thankful that we have such a loving, wonderful God and you have reverence for Him and respect unto Him, one, honor Him on the day that's supposed to be honoring unto Him that we're, we're trying to recognize Him as. But two, and even more important than that, why don't you share that with other people? When we get together with our family, when you get together with friends, it's a great time. What better time than a day that's actually set aside on the calendar to talk about Jesus Christ and His birth and what it meant for us and, and the fact that He died for our sins and share that with people who don't know the gospel or people who have heard it and haven't received it. Um, I believe that will truly be a blessing unto God that'll show that'll show how much you love him and appreciate what you have already received and appreciate the gift that you've received when you can share that with other people. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for sending your son to die for our sins, dear Lord, and that he came and, and that you were that you were made flesh and dwelt among us, dear Lord, as a light in the world, as a shining example for us to follow, dear Lord. I, um, I pray that you would please stir us up. Help us not to get caught up in, in the, the, the gifts and the, and the food and everything else. Yes, we can enjoy them and celebrate, dear Lord, but help us never to lose sight of the fact that we are celebrating the birth of Christ. And, um, and, and we're very thankful for that, dear Lord. I pray that you please stir up our hearts to, to tell others about this great news and the good news, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.